I'm standing on the crest of a hill behind the British lines and overlooking the battlefield outside the black seaport of Balaclava in the Crimea. Perhaps you can hear the occasional discharge of a heavy gun in the distance. Those guns are British guns, which only a short time ago were captured by the Russian troops of Tsar Nicholas I. With this turn of events on this 25th of October, 1854, a big step has been taken by the Russians toward tracking the Allied siege of Sevastopol. This siege, as the world knows, has been in progress for more than one month, for it was on September 14th that the British and French armies, with some help from their Turkish allies, landed on the Crimean Peninsula and encircled the fortress city of Sevastopol. But any hope of a quick capitulation by the Russians has come to an end with today's dramatic upset. It's now a question of whether even the siege of Sevastopol itself can be maintained. Well, the Russians have launched a relieving action here at Balaclava, which, if it continues, would seem to have every prospect of success. We're set up just behind the battle. October 25th, 1854, Balaclava in the Crimea. The charge of the British Light Brigade. You are there. CBS takes you back 96 years to the Battle of Balaclava in the Crimean War and the celebrated charge of the British Light Cavalry. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. With all the modern facilities of radio present and CBS newsmen reporting from the scene. You are there. You are there is based on historical fact and quotation. And now, October 25th, 1854. A hill inside the Allied line, overlooking the battlefield at Balaclava and Bill Leonard. It's very black indeed for the British, French, and Turkish allies. The Russians have succeeded in taking three Allied defense positions down in the valley below our observation point. There seems to be a, a lull now in the battle. Both sides are regrouping and tending their wounded. Well, while we're waiting to see what develops, let me try to describe the battlefield here at Balaclava. It's a, a horseshoe-shaped valley, I'd say, about four miles long. An almost perfect horseshoe, but wide, very wide, over a mile wide at all its points, and ringed by a chain of hills. Now, we're set up on one of these hills at the western end of the valley. Directly below us, about 100 feet below, the floor of the valley is thick now with tents, horses, and soldiers in the very colored uniforms of the Allies. Especially striking are the brass helmets and the scarlet and blue uniforms of the British heavy cavalry. In the dim distance, we can see the movements of the Tsarist reinforcements. And on the hills behind and above them, I can make out the heavy field guns and emplacements of the Russian artillery, and it's a formidable concentration indeed, believe me. Uh, two of my CBS colleagues are stationed down in the valley with the British forces. Well over to my left, with the British cavalry divisions under the command of Lord Lucan, Ned Calmer is waiting to give you the picture as he sees it at the moment, so come in, Ned Calmer. The men around this area, tough, brave cavalrymen, are inspecting their equipment, tending their horses, doing the 101 little things that add up to an attitude of readiness, an attitude of waiting, waiting for the signal to go into battle, which they expect momentarily. Naturally, it's the heavy cavalry brigade under General Scarlett, which expects to bear the brunt of any attack launched against the Russian position. Near where I'm standing is the famous Scottish company, the Inner Killing, dressed in their distinctive tilts. You can probably hear their bagpipes, and there are the Scots, the Greys, and the Royal Dragoons. Some distance behind my position, the Light Cavalry, the Light Brigade, under the command of Lord Cardigan, is making its own preparations to support the heavy cavalry in battle. We're waiting down here. We're watching. Something is certain to happen, but when? Meanwhile, Don Hollenbeck is stationed to my right, a mile and a half across the valley. He's covering the area around the headquarters of Brigadier Airy, the ranking officer in charge of all Allied forces in this battle. How do things look from your vantage point, Don? I'm standing something closer than a stone's throw from Brigadier Airy's tent, and since the sudden, breathtaking attack of the Russians against the Turks a short while ago, this has been an area of tremendous activity. Men hurrying in and out of the tent, 
men carrying messages to and from Lord Raglan, the Allied Commander-in-Chief in the Crimea, men waiting outside for orders, for rumors, anything. Everyone here is asking the question they must be asking all over the battlefield. Where were the British when the attack was launched? There are soldiers all around me as I stand here, and I'd like to let you hear what they're thinking. Here, sir, please, you. Uh, me? Yes, would you let me ask you a few questions for the American radio audience? Let's hear the questions, and then I'll tell you. All right, what's your, what's your name? That's the first question I ain't going to answer. That's all right. Okay, now, you're a soldier in No, the... you don't. You don't name my company. Well, if you don't want to... Uh... I ain't going to say nothing if you give out my name of company. All right, all right. Since we haven't mentioned your name or your company, maybe you can be a little more frank. Happen I can. My two best friends have been killed by the cholera, and I ain't happy about it. Well, naturally not, naturally not. Now, don't get me wrong. I expect to see my friends die. That's what soldiering comes to. A chance to be with your friends when they die. Right. But what did they die for? That's what I want to know, sir. You think it was because so as we could beat the Russians? Well, wasn't that true? Was it? Why didn't we move up and help the Turks at those gun positions? It have made my friends die in the cholera mean something, sir. Why didn't we? Well, maybe the higher strategy. Higher strategy. I know all about higher strategy. I was there when we attacked this blasted Crimean Peninsula in the first place. We'd all have been killed if the Russians didn't withdraw first. And all because back in London, the chaps with the wigs didn't know the water on the side of that peninsula was too shallow for our ship. Yes, yes, I know all about that. I believe it's generally considered a blunder, but it didn't have any bad consequences. Bill, Bill, here, come here. Don't talk that way. Are you leave me be, Elf. No, you don't. Excuse me, sir, but I don't want Bill to get in trouble. It's all right. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you very Bill much. Bill thinks too much, sir. The soldier's got no right to think. Come on, Bill. Oh, I didn't expect to get such a frank statement of the complaints of the ordinary soldier, but I can say that when we have no microphone with us, we do hear such statements often. Now, here's a young infantryman standing right beside me who was shaking his head very vigorously while his fellow soldier was talking. You don't agree with what's just been said? No, I don't. Well, the other man raised an interesting point, though I don't think he pursued it. The point is to what you are fighting for. I'm fighting for the Queen, God bless her. You, Queen Victoria, means your country, and that's your country that you're fighting for, is that it? That's right, sir. And in what way is the Queen threatened by the Russians? I don't rightly know, sir. Uh, I leave it to them as understand such things to tell me. Thank you very much. And now here, oh, here, over here, please, is a French lieutenant. Monsieur, you speak English. We oui, uh, uh, have... Uh, Would you just come a little closer, please? Thank you. Now, what do you think of the alliance between your country and the English and the Turks? Well, I am very happy, monsieur, to <coughs> fight with such brave men. The three armies get along well together? Oui. Uh, one little thing I, I could wish would not be so. And what's that? Well, you must understand, monsieur, that I am a liaison officer. I, I come together with English command officers. Yes, yes, of course. We are all en rapport. We are friends, is it not? But just... This one little thing. And what is that? Lord Raglan, the Allied Commander in Chief. I would wish that when he talks of the enemy, he would not any longer call them the French. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much. And now I've got word from Bill Leonard up there on the hill behind me, so go ahead, Bill Leonard. I have at my microphone a most keen observer of this war, one of the most respected and best-informed newspaper correspondents in the whole world, Mr. William Howard Russell of the London Times. Bill Russell, how do things appear to you at this moment? Well, in all candor, Mr. Leonard, I'm frightfully disturbed. Well, I know that many of us here were amazed that the British divisions did not move up in defense of the Turks, and I imagine... Yes, I can't understand that. Of course, we didn't have much that could be moved up at the time. We weren't properly reinforced by infantry. Yes, but when the Russians were storming the Turkish positions out there, uh, where was the British cavalry? Uh, to an Englishman, Mr. Leonard, that's a disturbing question. I can only say that it may have seemed more important to move the cavalry to the right, as Lord Lucan did, in order to protect the road to Balaclava. I can only hope it was the proper move. Of course, there, there have been a, a number of mystifying things from the very start of this war, haven't there? You know... 
the various things that we correspondents have discussed privately from time to time. Yes, I presume you mean such things as uh, uh, consulting the ghost of Napoleon as to how to fight the war. Yes, yes, that, that story about using a sort of Ouija board to communicate with Napoleon. Well, I've heard that said, and much more about the... Uh, you might say, uh, casual arrangements for this campaign. Yes, yeah, such as the, the study of a few artist sketches of Sevastopol. That was, uh, shall we say, an unusual way to prepare a siege. Huh? <laughs> I can only agree. Of course, there's a, there's a further question, a sort of moral question, which is being asked in some neutral countries. I'd, well, I'd like to hear an Englishman's viewpoint. I have no official standing, Mr. Leonard. No, but uh, as a representative of the London Times, you're well-informed and... Well, what I refer to is what happened when this war started. The Tsar invaded the Transdanube provinces in the Balkans. Yes, and of course that's why the British and French troops were brought out to the Black Sea and stationed at Varna. Correct. But this Allied move was for defense against possible Russian attack. And when the Russians did not attack, when they, when they drew back, when they evacuated the provinces they'd taken, there, were, there was no apparent cause for war. Why then did the British and the French invade the Crimea? Well, uh, uh, we had our troops there. We'd, uh, we'd brought them all the way. Uh, we, um, we felt that... Uh, you mean, having brought them all the way, the war office wanted to do something with them? Well, I'm not sure I'd put it that way, Mr. Leonard. Uh, I'd say we had to show Russia we were in earnest. Well, anyway, thank you, Bill Russell of the London Times. And now, far down the valley, we can see the Russian troops beginning to move. Yes, there's a whole company of cavalry cantering across the valley in tight formation. Now they're, they're wheeling over to the right, and they're, they're coming this way. They may be getting set for an attack. No, no, they wheel again. All, all of these preparations would certainly seem to indicate that another Russian attack is in the offing, perhaps in a few moments, perhaps not. We'll try to get more information about what these Russian movements mean, and while we do, this would be a, an excellent time to hear from the veteran CBS News analyst, Quincy Howe who's stationed in CBS's temporary headquarters in a farmhouse to the rear of the hill on which we stand. Come in, Quincy Howe. Day of decision. Up to now, there's been little but confusion in this war. Its causes are obscure, involved, contradictory. Tsar Nicholas I says that Russia has set out to become the protector of Orthodox Christians against Turkish persecution. The Turks claim that Orthodox Christians suffer no persecution. The English have never seen any religious issue at stake in this war. They assert that if the Russians occupy Constantinople, well, that would make the Russians guilty of political aggression against a weak people. The Tsar replies that Britain's concern for weak people is sheer hypocrisy, that what really worries Britain is Russia's threat to the Dardanelles and to the vital land route to India. Napoleon III of France has been declaring that as a good Roman Catholic, he cannot admit the Russian claims that Orthodox Christians deserves special treatment. Well, so much confusion has surrounded the start of this war that each side calls the other the aggressor and with a certain amount of justice. One thing, though, is certain. Whatever religious or political consequences this war will have, the economic consequences will be far-reaching. And today, on the plain of Balaclava, all these issues may be finally resolved. Always remember, the Allies are still besieging Sevastopol. And whether it will stand or fall may be determined by what happens right here today. This, as I said, is a day of decision. And uh, just a moment, a note has been handed to me. Ned Calmer at British Cavalry Headquarters has some news for us. Come in, Ned Calmer. I've interrupted Quincy Howe's analysis because I've been fortunate enough to persuade Lord Lucan, the British Cavalry Commander, to grant us a short interview. Uh, very short, young man. Uh, Lord Lucan, we've been noticing Russian troop movements at the far end of the valley. Do you expect another attack, sir? A military man always expects an attack, sir. And if the Russians are foolhardy enough to launch one, they'll meet with, uh, shall we say, a warm reception at the hands of Her Majesty's cavalry. Well, would you tell us why the British troops did not support the Turks holding the advanced positions when the Russians attacked earlier today? Uh, uh, no comment. Well, uh, do you expect a counterattack before the Russians move again? No comment. Can you tell us something about your cavalry, Lord Lucan? Well, I'm sure that even the enemy must know that Her Majesty's heavy cavalry divisions are gallant and brave troops, and, and that with their customary support of artillery and infantry, they will, as always, give a good account of themselves. Then you're relying on the heavy brigade. Oh, most assuredly. 
What about Lord Carnigan's light cavalry brigade, sir? Well, it's no secret, even to the enemy, that there are only around 600, uh, 607 to be exact in this light brigade, a very small force. Small, Lord Lucan, but great fighting men, as I certainly can testify. Well, I have no fault to find with the men, but it's unwise to expect too much of them. There are only 600 strong, and they are armed with sabers and lancers. Uh, Little for quick lightning action, but the, uh, the heavies... General Scarlet's men, they're the chaps for the heavy work. <laughs> yes, and now, if you'll <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much, Lord Lucan. Now, Don Hollenbeck, over to my right across the Balaclava Valley, wants the microphone. So come in, Don. It seems increasingly clear here that whatever action develops here today will see the cavalry in the key position. For another point of view on the use of cavalry in battle, I have here a famous light cavalry officer, Captain Lewis Edward Nolan. Captain Nolan is well known to all correspondents as a blunt, outspoken man. Captain Nolan, I'd say many of your fellow British officers find you somewhat too blunt, too outspoken, although all of them have read your works on the cavalry and its maneuvers. Captain Nolan's an expert on cavalry, an expert who disagrees with many other experts. That's fair to say, isn't it, Captain? It's fair if you call the others experts. I don't. Well, that might be called a fair sample of your bluntness. Well, I say what I think. Well, all right. Now, just how do your views differ from those of some of your fellow officers? I think all this emphasis on the heavy cavalry is wrong. I think the light cavalry can do anything the heavies can do and do it better. Well, after all, Captain Nolan, the light cavalry with sabers or lances can scarcely charge big guns and large armed forces, can it? At Blenheim in 1704, it was the British light cavalry that won the day against the French and the Bavarians. In 1812, at Salamanca, a single brigade of our light cavalry cut through the French army. The British Light Cavalry can break squares, take batteries, ride over columns of infantry, beat any other cavalry in the world. Captain Nolan, sir. You seem to be wanted, Captain. Beauty Air is asking for you, sir. Huh? Oh, uh, very well. That I'll was come Captain on. Nolan, and he's... Well, he's not the only one moving toward Brigadier Airy's tent. There's a stir, a bustle, as though something were... Yes, something is going to happen. The Allies may counterattack. I don't believe there's any Russian activity, although, of course, I can't see what's going on farther down the valley. So I'm going to switch you back to Bill Leonard, who commands the view of the whole battlefield. Come in, Bill Leonard. This is Bill Leonard again. Now, I, I do have, as Don Hollenbeck told you, a better view of things up here, and I can say that masses of Russian horsemen down the valley are still moving about, apparently getting ready for battle. But most of the activity is in the British camp below me. Every few seconds, it seems, a man leaves Brigadier Airy's tent and runs across the ground to his company. You can hear those trumpets sounding, and I'm sure an attack is in prospect. Yes, there's General Scarlet raising his sword out in front of the heavy cavalry. The Greys, the Enniskillens, the Dragoons, he's raising his sword. I'm sure he's calling for the attack. There are the trumpets, trumpets sounding the advance, and the cavalry is breaking into a trot. What a, what a sight that is. Perfect, rhythmic precision. Lines of heavy cavalry are moving up and up, up, but... The light brigade now under Cardigan is not moving. They've, they've mounted their horses, but they appear to be standing by for orders. This is the heavy cavalry that's going into action before our very eyes. The Russians are moving to meet them. The Russian cavalry, I'd say, oh, 1,500, 2,000 Cossacks and Hussars are advancing up the valley. They're formed into a great solid square and are galloping forward toward the British. I, I've never seen anything like this. A, a solid block of Russian horsemen is advancing to meet the British heavy cavalry. They... Why, well, they outnumber the British, I'd say, two to one, and they're moving toward a head-on collision. The, the, those are the Russian guns speaking now. The British heavy cavalry has broken into a canter. There's General Scarlet out in front, waving his sword. They're still about 500 yards apart. And there, there's the gallop, the call to the gallop, and now General Scarlet's saber is pointing, he's pointing it toward the Russians. The lances go down, and there's the charge. The British heavy cavalry is now in full charge against the Russians, and, and, and the Russians have have halted. They've stopped. They're going to take the charge head on. They're standing stock still. They're bracing for the full impact of the British charge. Oh, they, they, they've hit them. The first British line has engaged the Russians. The British cavalry is tangling hand-to-hand -hand now with them. They're, they're fighting hand-to-hand, -hand, sword to sword, and, and, and desperately. The British are, are penetrating. We can see their scarlet tunics threading through that, that big wall of dark gray, and, and the sun flashing on their swords. Men are Men are going down, and what a sight. That, that whole great mass of men in motion, and seething with the quick downward slash of swords and the rearing of those horses. 
There's a, there's a scarlet tunic falling in an arc to the ground, and a, and a horse is coming back this way, riderless. Don Hollenbeck may have a closer view of this action. Let's have him tell us what he sees. Come in, won't you, Don Hollenbeck? Are you there, Don Hollenbeck? Are you there, Don? Come in, Don Hollenbeck. I, I can't see Hollenbeck in the valley below me, and apparently... Well, I, I don't know what's happened to him. We'll try again in a moment. But now look, look, out on the battlefield, the Russians are breaking. The Russian cavalry is giving way. They're turning, turning now. They're beginning to break. They're turning, and they're racing back down the valley. And now on the field, those red tunics of the British are in the majority. I think for the first time, the Russians seem to have broken in complete rout. They're scrambling back, wildly back, behind that protective line of guns far down the valley. That cheer, that cheer going up from some of the infantrymen who've come up on the hill to watch the battle. I, well, I, <laughs> I can scarcely believe it in, in this short time, in just a few minutes, it seems, a superior body of Russians has been driven back. There are men lying down there on that battlefield, more Russians than British, but many, many of each. The ground down there is strewn with helmets and swords and lances and the bodies of fallen men and fallen horses. Uh, Many of the British are dismounting now. They've, they've won the field, and they're going to take care of their wounded. They're, well, there's a pause in the battle now. It may be only momentary, though it, it would seem that the British would want to press their advantage. Uh, the heavy brigade may be about to reform its lines, and possibly reinforcements are going to come up quickly. Yeah, just, just a moment. Uh, Don Hollenbeck has finally made contact with us. Don Hollenbeck is apparently safe. He's calling for the air. Come in, Don. There's more excitement and stir around Brigadier Airy's headquarters now. And there's Nolan, Captain Nolan. He's just left Airy and he's leaped on his horse. He's starting across the valley at full gallop. I don't know where he's going. The only place he can be headed for is his own outfit, the Light Brigade, over across the field where Ned Calmer is stationed. I can't imagine what message Nolan is carrying to the Light Brigade unless it is simply to shift position. But then why the extreme, the really frantic haste? I can see him riding across the valley and how that man can ride. He's reached the light brigade and dismounted now. Ned Calmer, can you give us any information? Come in, Ned Calmer. Captain Nolan has just arrived here. He's talking now to Lord Lucan, Lord Cardigan, and some of their aides. They're not 30 yards away from me. I must say they're, they're talking quite heatedly. They seem to be questioning Nolan closely. He's very excited, talking volubly, gesticulating, waving his arms. He's pointing out toward the valley, toward the far end of the valley that's bristling with Russian guns. But I can't believe... Lord Lucan is definitely arguing with Captain Nolan, and Nolan continues to point dramatically out toward the valley. Lord Lucan's shaking his head now. He throws up his hand. He's giving orders to Lord Cardigan. I can't hear... I can't hear what... I can't say what's going to happen here, but you heard those trumpet calls. Men are getting to their horses. Nolan is mounting, but I don't understand how... If that valley, if that's where they're headed, and I don't know where else they could be going, that valley is impregnable. There's nothing that 600 men with sabers could possibly accomplish against those guns. They'd have no protective fire, no support that I can see. But perhaps I've misunderstood all the signs. Possibly the light brigade is not going to charge after all. No, they're forming ranks. This is a very peculiar state of a... Come up, boy. Hello there. That was the signal they're riding. The light brigade is moving forward. <laughs> in two lines, in perfect formation, and galloping down the valley. Away from my position here and over a slight rise. They're heading straight toward the Russian line. I'm going to try to move further down the valley beyond that rise. But meanwhile, maybe Don Hollenbeck across the valley from me at Brigadier Harry's headquarters. Maybe he knows what's in the wind. So come in, Don Hollenbeck. Headquarters here is in an uproar. The light brigade certainly does seem to be charging straight into the main Russian line. They're, they're beginning to ride by now just as if nothing could stop them. Some of the officers here say that Captain Nolan has made a terrible mistake. They say he did not carry an order for the light brigade to charge simply to advance to a forward position. And they feel he either misunderstood that order or he deliberately misinterpreted it so that he could put his theories about light cavalry to a test. That's all from here now. 
Over to Bill Leonard on the hill overlooking the valley. Come in, Bill Leonard. In the distance, those 600 cavalrymen of the Light Brigade are definitely, definitely heading straight down the valley. There can be no question about it. The Russians, at, at least 2,000 of them, are uh, uh, drawn up in two solid masses behind a wall of cannon stretched across the valley. Not only that, the hills overlooking that main Russian line are studded with field artillery, and the Russians even have troops in reserve behind their lines. This is the formidable offense the 600 British cavalrymen are going to attempt to breach. The Russians are braced, waiting, and the Light Brigade is getting closer and closer. Aren't they going to turn back? I, I can easily pick out Captain Nolan in the vanguard. And there, there go the guns. Stop it. They, oh, they must be going to turn away. This must be a feint. No, they're, they're dashing straight into the fire of those guns. That line of guns is one great sheet of flames, and... This is, this is awful. Their men are going. Captain Nolan, Captain Nolan just tumbled from his horse, and now the guns and nails on both sides have opened up on the British. They're, they're, they're caught in the, in the crossfire. Horses rearing and wanting to turn, and the, and the horsemen def, desperately pushing them forward and, and still forward. And now they've reached the, the line of cannon. They're hurling themselves on the Cossacks and Hazars, the massed Russian cavalry, and hopelessly outnumbered. Of course, there were, uh, what, what is it, 600 men in the charge. There are many, many fewer now, and they're going down and and down. And all oh, the Russian artillerymen have turned their line of cannon around there. They're firing straight into that mass of men. Russian guns are shooting into that struggling mass of friend and foe alike. Yes, the, the, the Russians have turned their guns on their own men tangling with the British. Horses without riders are running in crazy circles around the battlefield. It can't go on much longer. It just can't. The carnage is unbelievable. Now the, the British light cavalrymen, those few remnants of those 600, are beginning to withdraw to, and making their way back through the Russian line of guns. And as they make their way back, many of them more are falling and, and going down. The Russian cannon have stopped firing. Their, their terrible work is finished. The cannon are quiet. It's, it's, it's over. It's, it's really over. There are just a few straggling British survivors coming back out of that valley of horror, most of them on foot and many of them wounded. The Russian cavalry, Russians are not pursuing them. They're, they're not following at all. They're, they're back there behind their line of artillery, and it's, it's clear that they, too, have suffered heavy losses. Now I see that the nearest of the British survivors are are a good way up the valley. I, I can see Ned Calmer all set up now, far over to the left. I, I see him there with the soldiers moving painfully past him, slow and in halting retreat. And so we switch you now to Ned Calmer. Come, Ned. I'm quite near the men as they return from the horrible slaughter that we've just witnessed. They're coming quite close to me now. I'm going to try to get some of them to speak to you. Yes, sir, you. Would you let me ask you a few questions? No, no, leave me alone. Leave me alone. Uh, uh, Corporal, could you come here for just a moment? No, uh, i got to get these men back. I'm never going to get any of these men to talk. I'm supposed to tell you what I've seen, but I can think only of these men of the cavalry. I've, I've lived with them for weeks now. I've come to know them well. They're my friends. They're coming back now, some of them are. Maybe you can hear them going past. A few feet from me. Well, I'm a reporter. I should give you facts and figures and statistics. 607 of my friends of the Light Brigade went into this charge today. It's difficult to estimate, but I'd say only 150 of my friends have come back. And in England, there are 607 homes where this charge of the Light Brigade will never be forgotten by children and parents and widows. There's been nothing decisive on this battlefield yet. It still remains to be seen whether the Russians will take Balaclava. October 25th, 1854, Balaclava in the Crimea. The British Light Brigade charges a vastly superior Russian force. You 
are there. You've been listening to The Charge of the Light Brigade in the series You Are There. Today's program was written by Robert Senadella, directed by John Dietz, and produced by the CBS Documentary Unit under the supervision of Werner Michel. William Howard Russell was played by Gibson Parker, Mercer McCloud was Lord Lucan, and Burford Hampton was Captain Nolan. Others in the cast included Guy Sorrell, William Padmore, and Alf Shirley. You Are There is brought to you every fourth Sunday. The next broadcast will be heard Sunday, March 19th at the same time over most of these same stations. Next month, 